we've got our panel here ready to go. So my job is just to introduce Rob Gregory to my right, who will then run us through our fantastic panel. Um, this panel is all about the Energy Charter, and we're now more than 12 months into that important initiative, so it's going to be fantastic to get a sense of where it's up to from a range of different perspectives. Uh, Rob will take the, uh, take the mic shortly, but as we, uh, we introduced uh, Rob this morning from Maddox Law Firm, he's a partner at Maddox, a long-time uh, friend of ECA, uh, really specialises uh, in commercial law and technology. He's the head of their national education practice. His biggest claim to fame, though, is writing ECA's uh, Energy Regulation Handbook, which is quite a task for those people who know energy regulation to put all that in one document. Uh, and he's going to do a great job of leading us through this conversation today. Uh, can I introduce and welcome Rob Gregory. Thanks, Chris, and I, I feel like I need to start with a disclaimer that um, somebody else did most of the writing on the National Energy Regulation Handbook, but it was a great project. It's something that we really uh, enjoy doing with ECA um, and look forward to reprising probably across the course of the year this year as well. So today's session is really around the Energy Charter, how it's working, how did it come to be, and what are we going to be looking at in the future? We're really fortunate to be joined by CEOs and senior leaders of businesses that basically are the interface between consumers and energy. Um, we might also say that they're very fortunate to be in a room with so many consumer representatives, but people from the, the industry as well, to hear the points of views that I'm sure people are going to want to express today. So with that in mind, um, and to continue the theme from the earlier sessions, there is a Slido app. Um, please. As questions occur to you, uh, put them in, and then towards the end, we'll definitely have a time to uh, address those questions. Can I just get a quick show of, uh, if you like, baseline knowledge? Who, who's aware of the charter and feels that they've got a pretty good handle on what it is? OK, I think at this point, could I just jump to the next slide, whoever's? Thank you. So the energy charter was really created in response to the degree of concern that has been uh, exposed in a lot of the consumer research that's been discussed this morning, that perhaps consumers, and particularly residential and small business consumers, are feeling disconnected, disengaged, disempowered when it comes to their energy choices. The, across the uh, course of the year in, in 2018, there was a lot of work put into developing the charter document um, and some of the supporting structures, including with Energy Consumers Australia, to enable the uh, Energy Charter to, to function as a quasi-institution. And that led to the publication of the document in uh, early 2019, January 2019. You'll see, if anyone's interested to grab it, that there's a URL for it there. The Charter really has the key purpose, and it picks up on the national energy, national gas uh, objectives, which are the, the expressed in the national energy law, the national gas law, to promote efficient investment and efficient operation and use of gas, electricity, for the long-term interest of consumers with respect to price, quality, safety, reliability and security of supply. So they're the sort of, if you like, the base level legal obligations, particularly on regulators but indirectly on participants in the system set down by law. But there's an industry vision really to go beyond that, to together deliver energy for a better Australia. And the purpose of the Charter in terms of delivering that vision was really to progress the culture and solutions required to deliver a more affordable, reliable and sustainable energy system for all Australians and in line with community expectations. There were guiding values enunciated of being invested and making a difference, be open, learn, improve, think big, be bold. And it's quite easy, I think, to be a bit cynical about that sort of corporate language, but the questions that we're here to talk about today is to the extent to which that's really genuinely been embodied. Drawing on that vision, purpose and guiding values, um, five principles were enunciated, the most important of which 
principle one, but really literally in the centre of the diagram, is to put customers at the centre of the business and the energy system, and bearing in mind it's energy businesses that are signing up to this. We will improve energy affordability for customers. We will provide energy safely, sustainably and reliably. And reliably. So picking up on some of those values that once again coming through the customer research or consumer research. We will improve the consumer experience and will support customers facing vulnerable circumstances. And to avoid what Rosemary described this morning of, of shelfware, yet another worthy set of documents that get put on a shelf and then ignored, there's a, a series of actions and steps to develop an accountability mechanism for this. There is, in fact, an Energy Charter independent accountability panel. So in uh, September last year, 2019, each of the 18 members of the Charter delivered disclosure statements which were, which were published and the Independent Accountability Panel reviewed those disclosure statements, conducted a range of um, consumer and other activities to analyse them and published a report that really uh, compares them and picks up on a number of, in fact, six very key themes. The first is to know your customers and communities. The second is to go above and beyond compliance. Third is to leverage high impact points for change together. Importantly, to develop metrics and report on progress. Close the loop on initiatives, get things done. And finally, to elevate and optimise dispute resolution. So with that quick background to the Charter, the Independent Accountability Panel process, we'll ask each of our um, representatives here today to have a brief uh, opening statement around th three quick key questions. What, from their organisation's perspective, how is and how will the Energy Charter rebuild trust with consumers? What, we'll ask each of them what their organisation's experience with the Energy Charter has been in its first year and how the Charter will help its organisation to service customers in the future. So with that, I'd like to firstly introduce Andrew Richards. Andrew has got over 30 years of energy industry and infrastructure development experience, and relevantly for the last three years, he's been the Chief Executive Officer of the Energy Users Association of Australia, the EUAA. The EUAA is the peak national body representing Australian commercial and industrial electricity and gas users. It's also relevant to note that uh, last year, in 2019, Andrew was a representative on the industry, sorry, the Independent Accountability Panel, the IAP, uh, but really is here today speaking from the large consumer's perspective. Andrew. Thanks, Rob, and um, thanks to the ECA for this opportunity. Rosemary, thank you very much. Um, it'll be sad to see you go. Um, so in answering the three questions, and I don't want to get the stop go sign up the back, so I will be quick. Um, so re rebuilding trust with customers through this process, I think uh, a level of transparency is, is incredibly important, along with having more no-nonsense conversations between customers and the industry. Because I think once we start doing more of that, we actually find that buyers and sellers have a lot in common, particularly in what can only be described as a high-stress policy and regulatory environment for energy users and, and for the industry. And so the more we can collaborate on, on issues and on solutions, the better off we're all going to be, because at the end of the day, we need each other to be successful. Um, the industry doesn't want consumers to go broke, uh, and we don't want the industry to be under undue stress, because that also increases electricity prices and gas prices. So having that no-nonsense conversation is a really good start, and I think the Charter uh, is, is providing a platform for that to occur. Our organisation's experience is a bit unique because of my role on, uh, on the Independent Accountability Panel. It's fair to say that a lot of the members of the EUAA still see it quite sceptically. Um, so their involvement has been through largely through, through my involvement and through my staff's involvement. Um, we're still very positive about it and, and in many ways um, there were some pretty white knuckle moments in year one I'm, and I'm looking at the CEOs and other representatives on this, on this panel and congratulations for, for turning up yet again to these sorts of things. I think it's really important. So as much as there were some white knuckle moments in year one and year one was really the year of words, this year, year two of the, of the charter is, is probably more important because it's the doing year. It's the year that you come out and look at 
the independent accountability panel and the, the recommendations that are relevant to you and start working towards those and start delivering on the commitments that you've made. And I think I've got a lot of confidence that at, le at CEO level, right down to staff level in the, in the, in the signatories, that that's going to happen. I, I still I feel as though there's a really strong um, drive for that. So our experience so far has been uh, positive, but we need to make sure that we get more and more consumer involvement in it directly, and we'll, we'll hope to play a role in that. So how will it help service our customers? Well, through that first element, really, in encouraging greater and deeper conversations, and a no BS com type of conversation about what really matters going forward, both as individual customers, and some of, some of our members spend a million dollars a day on energy, so they, they, they take it pretty seriously. Um, some of the research that was being presented so it shows that you know consumers only care about the industry when they're angry with it, and we've got to try and change that conversation too. And just one of the things that we've been really strong on, particularly with large commercial industrial, is that they are looking for a partner in this. They are looking for some independent advice in this because they are under stress. Everyone's under stress in such a, a changeable environment. And, and quite frankly, we can't always rely on governments to lead the way. And what we're seeing more and more is that the industry and its customers need to lead the way on the transition. Um, it can't be poli all policy-led. It needs to also be market or consumer and industry-led. Thanks very much, Andrew. Next, uh, I'd like to introduce Jared Brody. Jared is the uh, CEO of the Consumer Action Law Centre, an independent, not-for-profit consumer organisation in Melbourne. Um, amongst other things, Consumer Action provides financial counselling, legal advice and representation to support vulnerable, vulnerable and disadvantaged Victorians. It then draws on its direct service delivery and knowledge from that consumer experience uh, in modern markets to pursue consumer interest campaigns and policy reform at both state and national levels. Uh, Jared is also the chair of the Consumers Federation of Australia, the peak body for consumer organisations. Jared. Um, thank you, Robin. Thank you also for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'd just like to make two, I guess, interacting, uh, raise two interacting issues in my opening remarks. The first isn't directly related to the Charter, so if you'll indulge me, but does relate to, uh, and it recalls that very generous welcome we had this morning um, from Eddie on, on behalf of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. I just wanted to mention a report that my centre released last week in partnership with Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service. Um, the report provides findings of a collaborative project that was created um, after there had been some research to show there was real needs around consumer issues in uh, Victorian Aboriginal communities. Um, through the project, our, our teams made uh, 15 community visits, reaching 800 people over, over the course of the year, and more than 80 legal casework files were, were ran. Um, and a key rate aim of the project was to identify, understand and raise issues that we saw in the community to regulators, to others, to decision makers like people here in the, in the room. Um, the report, which is just on our website now, so I encourage you to have a look at it, but interestingly, uh, th out of the community engagement visits, 30% of people raised utilities issues. Um, on one of um, uh, the uh, engagement events, particularly around a women's prison, it was more than half of people raised utilities issues as consumer issues of highest concern for them. They were things like um, experience of disconnection or threats of disconnection, high and unaffordable bills, uh, there was water restrictions raised, um, confusing uh, marketing and high pressure sales, um, and people's lack of understanding or not being informed about the role of the Ombudsman Scheme, for example. I just thought I'd share this because I think it's important in you know, the week following the closing the gap report to Parliament that showed that still um, that those targets aren't, aren't, aren't being met, um, that we're all, all aware that there is a long way to go in our sector as well. And I hope businesses can look at that report and lessons in developing initiatives under the Charter in the future. Um, my second point was more directly related to the Energy Charter and I was part of the Energy Charter's user group. Um, this was a group of consumer representatives, um, Andrew as well, um, which we had the fortune of participating in over the last year. I should at this stage call out my colleagues that were involved, ably led by Chris Alexander, and many of them are here today. Um, I really learned a lot from their contributions. Um, I, I must say at the outset of this process, I was probably less than confident that the Charter would make much difference. Um, but I think I've been pleasantly surprised to see some real buy-in um, at very senior levels of um, industry and some promising initiatives. 
Um, I think a key factor has been the accountability panel, uh, which ensures that level of scrutiny, not only on specific commitments, um, but also importantly, whether the charter is having the desired impact around culture change um, and particularly a focus on issues um, such as customer vulnerability and fairness. I think it was helpful to see the panel's report and see what it said about you know, some of the challenges. So the difficulties in comparing the information provided and the challenges they had around measurement. I think an area of the focus, area of focus for the future um, to make this process even more meaningful um, is for businesses to provide much simpler disclosures, move away from just focusing on uh, regulatory compliance initiatives, they're already required to do that under, under the law, and focus more about that culture change. What are you doing to put the customer at the centre, which is that number one principle. Um, the other area of focus I would really encourage is a greater, uh, uh, encourage greater commitment is, um, and perhaps something we can discuss more in the panel session, uh, issues relating to customer vulnerability and fairness. Um, outside the energy sector, I was really impressed just last week to see the CEO of Telstra uh, focus on these issues in a speech that he gave, um, and it really signalling a change of strategy from Australia's biggest telco. He actually spoke um, in favour of a, a new re reform in our consumer law to have a general um, provision around fair conduct. Um, and he said that these, you know, simplest pop, um, uh, th that sort of change could have a real impact for their business and their customers. Um, I look forward to talking more about that on the panel. Thanks, Jared. Um, our next panelist is John Cleland, who is, or well, since uh, July 2016, John has been the CEO of Essential Energy here in New South Wales. Essential Energy has a customer base of 855,000 customers across roughly 95% of the land area of New South Wales. And John recognises the importance of energy as a key economic enabler for regional, rural and remote communities. Interestingly for us, our conversation today, John is also the chair of the CEO Council of the Energy Charter. So John, perhaps you would uh, like to give us your initial comments. Thanks Rob and <clears throat> good afternoon all. Um, I wonder if I might start by just making a couple of acknowledgements um, the first comment is that we're here talking about the first year of the Energy Charter and we're actually, actually sitting here, I'm reflecting on the first three years of the Energy Charter because that's probably, probably how long it actually, it actually took to, to get this up. And um, I'd like to start by acknowledging Rosemary Sinclair and the, the wonderful work Rosemary did in, in really being part of the original conception of the, the Energy Charter and and one of those, one of the small group of people who, who drove it over that two-year period prior to its, its actual formal launch. Um, and Rosemary, the, your, your legacy within this industry and within the Charter will, will stand proud, so thank you. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Sabine Heindel, the Director of the Energy Charter, and Navenka Codevel, the Chair of the Industry Working Group, who were once again instrumental in the Original, the original conception of the Energy Charter and, and getting it up and launched last year and then, of course, stewarding it, it through its first year. Um, the Energy Charter, and sorry, I'd also like to, almost a terrible mistake there, I'd also like to acknowledge the Essential Energy team who have been instrumental in the Energy Charter and particularly in preparing our, our first year's disclosure report. I always do make a point of mentioning my own my own team, but I'm particularly doing it today because they've all accumulated on one table right in front of me, <laughs> sort of as subtle as bricks. Um, <laughs> um, now I've completely lost my train of thought. So, and I'm sorry, Rob, I'm a little bit off, off track here, but um, I, I made some comments in the media last year about the Energy Charter and really why it came about. And in so doing, I acknowledged that this industry, the energy sector or the energy industry, has, has not got things right over the last 10 or 15 years. And outcomes for customers have been adverse in terms of price and reliability in particular. And so <clears throat> a big part of the energy charter is actually the industry coming together and acknowledging that fact. And if you like, building building the case around what this, what this fundamental change in the sector is all about. 
the fundamental change in the sector is all to do with decarbonisation and decentralisation and progressively digitisation. We all, we all know that and we talk about it regularly, but it's very important that we as an industry seek to have others understand the enormity of the change we're working through um, and the fact that Australia is not unique in having made a bit of a mess of this, this revolution and transition. Um, other, other jurisdictions globally are going through exactly the same, exactly the same process um, with exactly the same outcomes. And so the Energy Charter is fundamental to ensuring the industry actually does come together, address these issues, understand and acknowledge that we need to work in fundamentally different ways and we can't do it individually, we have to do it collectively. And that's, that's really the, the genesis of the, of the Energy Charter and why it, why it will be such a powerful body and, and um, initiative going forward. And so, um, first year of the Energy Charter, very, very briefly, has been enormously rewarding, um, enormously challenging, uh, just in terms of actually managing it from a logistical perspective, getting, getting 18 different organisations to go through their first disclosure reports. Um, we ended up with 18 slightly different, different takes on the same theme. And so there's huge opportunity going forward to, to um, finesse and improve the process, but fundamentally an incredibly important initiative that is a great positive for the energy sector going forward. I'm out of time, sorry. Out Thank of you, John. Uh, so next we have Ben Wilson. Uh, ben is the CEO of Australian Gas Infrastructure Group, um, which amongst other things comprises the Dampier Bunbury Pipeline, Dampier Development Group, Multinet Gas and Australian Gas Networks. So together, these represent one of Australia's largest gas infrastructure businesses across Australia with 2 million distribution customers, 4,000 kilometres of transmission pipelines and 34,000 kilometres of networks. He's doing a number of interesting projects, including partnering with the South Australian Government on Australia's largest renewable hydrogen project, Hydrogen Park in South Australia. Relevantly for our conversation today, and to bring perhaps some more of the national perspective, Ben is the Deputy Chair of Energy Networks Australia and Chairman of the ENA's Gas Committee. Ben. Thanks, Robin. It's a pleasure to be here, and I echo John's thanks to Rosemary and Sabine and Ivanka and everybody else, and also to you, John, because uh, it's a pretty um, uh, thankless task to try and herd a whole bunch of different companies and try and get us all to the same place, and I think you did a pretty good job, so, so well done on that. Um, I think to address the issues, and, and we do bring a, as, as Rob said, we operate over all of Australia except for the ACT and, and Tasmania, so we bring a pretty decent national perspective, I would say, to this, and we operate throughout the energy chain too, and we run a business which today delivers a fossil fuel, right? It's a low carbon fossil fuel compared to coal, and most electricity still comes from coal, but it is a fossil fuel, so when we talk about the decarbonisation journey, it's pretty relevant to us, actually, as we, as we think about that, and I'll come back to that. Uh, but as we think about the, the energy charter, you know, how does it work? How will it help to build trust? I think John made the key point, which is that it brings us together. I think as individual businesses, we all like to think that we're trying to do the right thing across the three, the three sides of the energy trilemma. We're trying to deliver for the customer. But actually, we can't do it alone. And the customer's experience doesn't depend on any single one of us. It depends on all of us, the producers, the generators, the transmission companies, the grids, whether electricity or gas, and the retailers. And actually, to deliver for the customer, we all need to work together. And that doesn't happen automatically in this disaggregated energy system. So I think this is a really you know, unique um, initiative in the industry and, and not one that's replicated in many places around the world to try to bring us all together and, and align us. So that that is what I'm trying to get out of this and I think what everybody else is trying to get out of this too, have us all pull together for the customer. What's been the experience so far? Um, I think it's been a, it's been a positive uh, journey for us. Uh, like I said, us, along with everybody else, I think we like to think we're doing a lot of good stuff. And year one has been an opportunity to set that out and explain how the things that we're doing relate to the energy charter principles. But it's also f forced us to be honest, hold ourselves to account what's not working yet, what's not perfect. You know, yes, our costs and our prices are lower than they were five years ago, but can they be lower still in the future? You know, 
are we doing enough on the sustainability journey? You know, we're doing a lot of stuff in the hydrogen space, but it's still at the sort of project phase. It's not at the mass rollout phase. And, and do the public know about what we're doing? Do they understand it? How's our customer satisfaction scores, right? Generally okay, generally okay, but are they, are they perfect in every area? No, they're not, so what more could we do there? Um, the, um, one of the other panelists mentioned vulnerable customers. I think that is an area where there is a significant discussion that needs to happen as to you know, what should we be doing? What do we mean by vulnerable? Financially vulnerable, physically vulnerable. Maybe English is not your first language and, and you don't understand how the utility industry works. How do you engage with us? What do we mean by vulnerable? What do those different vulnerable groups need? And what's our role as an energy sector as a whole as opposed to government or, or other parts of the the, the society, and within the energy sector, what's the role of the retailers, the networks, and so on. So it's forced us to challenge ourselves. Uh, what do we want to get out of the charter going forward? Again, I think the point has been made. Year one has been, I think, a good show and tell and, and a holding to account. What we now need is simplicity, clear targets, so that we can say in a year from now, two years from now, this is what's different for the customer compared to if we'd never done this. That's, that's what we're looking for this. Thank you, Ben. Next, we have uh, Andrew Bills. Andrew is the, uh, has been the Chief Executive Officer of CS Energy since uh, 2018. CS Energy is a Queensland government-owned um, coal and pumped hydro generator and a 50% owner of a retailer based in South East Queensland, I think is correct, Andrew? Um, prior to joining CS Andrew, Andrew worked for Origin Energy as a general manager of LPG and health, safety and environment and across the energy markets division, including Babcock and Brown Power before that. He's also currently a director of, on the board of the Australian Energy Council. Andrew. Thanks. Um, I'll just summarise what's been said before about you know, what the energy charting means because I think it's been well described by prior speakers. but. You've got every part of the value chain sitting on the, pay, on the stage here, and I think that's what the energy chart is about. Uh, it's not just me looking at my piece of that. It's the whole industry looking at where, where the customer sits in that because historically we've just looked after our own interest and where we're making a profit in that. And then it's forced... Uh, and technology's been a part of this. Technology has scrambled the value chain because the customer is, mo is mobilising right across that value chain. And I think it's coincident. It's not coincidental that we're actually looking at this holistically because of what technology is forcing. Um, so for me, it is very much the transparency, the holistic perspective, putting the customer at the centre of everything. For a generation business um, in our wholesale generator, and you know, I, I came from a mass market retail background, uh, it was perfect timing for me for the energy charter to be launched at the time of becoming CEO because I wanted to drive a lot of cultural change around the customer being at the centre of what we did in our strategy. And I've got to tell you, that was foreign to the people in my business. You go and talk to someone in Biloela about the customer and they've been generating in a coal-fired generator for decades, it's a foreign concept. So it really enabled me for a dialogue that was well overdue, that was needed, um, and we're on that journey. Um, we do have a uh, JV from, uh, with Alinta in South East Queensland. It's probably been the most successful market entry in, the, in Australia. Uh, and we're not leveraging that into, the, into CS Energy in terms of what we're doing as a business. So it's really opened people's eyes about what we should be doing to improve. How do we change that culture? How do we put the customer at the centre of everything we do? So for me, it's been fantastic timing. Um, year one, absolutely, I think... Uh, a lot of mistakes. I think our reports that we submitted were too complicated. Uh, they're, they're difficult to penetrate. The metrics aren't uh, generic across the whole industry. So there's a lot of improvements that are needed from us to make that easier for the next round. Um, and I think the other part for me on that is the changes that we then make as a result of what this process is about. And how do you highlight those in a way that people can connect into in a meaningful way? Um, so look, that's sort of where I see it. I think that this year will be a, a big improvement in terms of that reporting and accessibility to uh, c consumers more generally, um, but I think it can only get better. Thank you, Andrew. Next we have Mark Collette from Energy Australia. Uh, Mark is Energy Australia's Chief Customer Officer and has been since May 2019 
for, for res with responsibility for the servicing of Energy Australia's 1.7 million customers. Energy Australia is interesting in this space because I noted that the um, Independent Accountability Panel called out um, Energy Australia Managing Director Catherine Tanner's comment from uh, November last year, quote, you have to be living under a rock not to appreciate that customers want better service and lower prices. Perhaps, Mark, as you're addressing the question, you might uh, the, the questions you might want to reflect on Catherine's comment as well. Thanks, Rob, and thanks the ECA and Rosemary for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, at Energy Australia, we start a lot of our meetings with customer moments, where we just look at um, customer interactions, what's gone well or not gone well. And to give a sense of how the energy charter can make a difference, um, I'm going to talk to two customer moments, one from about a decade ago and one from last week. And the first one from a decade ago was when I was listening to a call in our contact centre and a customer called up to get connected to electricity and they said, oh, you, you're the guys, you supply electricity, don't you? And the um, contact centre agent at the time said at about this pace, a, a very legally accurate and completely confounding sentence, which was, we don't supply your electricity but we retail your supply. <laughs> at which point I was just gobsmacked about what does that mean? And I think everyone's had a conversation at a barbecue um, when you're in the energy industry and they say, well, you supply electricity, don't you? And you're like, well, sort of, but there's networks and there's poles and there's wires and there's generators and it's all really complicated and customers are looking for simplicity amongst all that complication. And one of the things, the areas energy charter makes a difference is it brings simplicity to that conversation and says, well, let's start with the, the customer and take away all that complexity. The second area um, and second customer moment I wanted to share was a, a conversation I had with a Queenslander last week and we changed our feed-in tariffs, we reduced our feed-in tariffs um, on the 27th of January and uh, it wasn't popular with our solar customers in Queensland and one had written me a letter which said something along the lines of, dear faceless man, you'll never contact me but it was very unfair what you did. So I gave him a call and uh, talked through, and he was a bit gobsmacked that I gave him a call in the first instance, and um, a very hard guy to get a hold of. It took three times, he was always very busy. But um, we got there in the end, and uh, we had a conversation. He said, well, I just don't think it's fair that prices come down for solar. And um, if you reflect on what uh, Jeff Harding said earlier this morning, he said retailers should be like um, Coles and Woolies and screwing down the price on all the input costs. I can buy solar energy or the, um, exactly what we buy from feed-in tariffs for uh, the average price I could have bought it in Queensland is six cents for the last uh, two years. We've been paying 16 cents. So if you just look at that in isolation, you say, well, for all the customers who use solar, should I buy it at six and charge them six? Or should I buy it at 16 and have a feed-in tariff that's, that's higher? And uh, it's not to say that we did do the right thing or the wrong thing, because everyone will have a, a perspective on feed-in tariffs and whether they should change. But it does come to, it needs to feel fair for customers. And at times when um, individual inputs change or policies change or things happen, it hasn't felt fair to customers. So I do think the areas that the Energy Charter has the opportunity to make a quite a big difference are around making it simpler and making it fairer for customers. And in, in year one, as Energy Australia, I think we've done some good things. We do measure our customer um, interactions and get feedback. And uh, we have invested in getting things like more accurate bills. And the feedback says we're doing better. We've made simpler products where all of our products that you sign up to now don't have um, price adjusters during the term of the product. They're just what you see is what you get. So some of those things make it simpler and in the view of customer feedback, we've had fairer. So there's things we can do on our own, but the real opportunity in the charter, as the other guys have said, is around doing things together. And um, an example, I'll just quote one in the interest of time, is our 24-7 uh, new connections in Victoria, or connections rather. So it's often been the case that if you forget to get your power connected for the weekend, you don't have power for the weekend, even if you've had a smart meter. And it's just been the way the industry worked. But with Gemina, um, Energy Australia and Gemina have got together and we've taken it down to an hour and 48 minutes to turn connections around. And that's the only area that it's happening, um, to my knowledge, in Australia. But if you forget to do it on a Friday, you can now have power connected for the weekend. And that's the sort of thing we can only do by doing it together. But it does make it simpler and feel fairer for customers. Thanks, Mark. Um, as 
has been said many times, Rosemary needs no introduction, but other than, once again, to, to join with everybody else and say thank you so much for what you've done over the last many years, uh, particularly in the energy space, but interested in, in your perspective and ECA's perspective on the energy charter so far. Uh, thank, thanks very much. Um, so in regard to um, how the Energy Charter can help to build trust, um, uh, for me it falls into um, three buckets really. Uh, the first is the Energy Charter is a vehicle to put the sector back together. Um, the sector has been disaggregated for all sorts of policy and regulatory uh, reasons. Um, but the fact of the matter is all the pieces come together on the consumer's bill and for a long time the consumer hasn't been happy with what's landed on the bill and hasn't really known what to do about that, that notion that came through in the research of consumers feeling stuck. So the first important thing I think in building trust is for the sector to take the step to put itself back together with everybody uh, sharing and aligned in their pursuit of better energy consumer outcomes. The second and very important thing from my perspective um, is that the involvement of the companies in the Charter started with a commitment from each of the CEOs of the companies involved. And to be really honest, given that I know I'm with a group of friends and um, nobody's going to say anything outside this room, uh, that was, uh, for us, absolutely critical. Um, you'll recall the period when the Charter was emerging was a pretty tough period in terms of corporate Australia and consumer reaction to outcomes um, seen through the banking sector. And there were those who were deeply cynical uh, about the whole charter uh, initiative. For me, it was terribly important in terms of an authentic approach to rebuilding trust that the CEOs of the companies involved personally committed to the charter. And that's actually what happened. The charter started with letters from the CEOs of the companies sitting along this platform and a number of others saying, I, name, uh, commit to the principles and processes of the Energy Charter signed personally by those CEOs. Um, I would quickly add that I think those CEOs have been carrying um, not more than their fair share, but uh, a disproportionate amount of the load in rebuilding the trust that the sector needs so badly. And I would really encourage any companies who are not members of the Energy Charter to have a very serious discussion at the CEO level about becoming a participant in the Energy Charter and building on the excellent work that's been done by the Foundation CEOs. And lastly, just in terms of how I think the Charter will rebuild trust, I think it's enabling a direct dialogue between industry and consumers uh, and consumer representatives. And I think the best way for you all to see the real value of that is to go to the Charter website and um, pick out any of the um, recordings of the CEO meetings uh, that were talking about the disclosures. Pick anyone you like. And what you'll hear is a CEO talking passionately about their business and their customers and the outcomes they want for their customers through changing the culture of their businesses. So it's a lens right into the heart of these businesses, not mediated by a regulatory process, not mediated by a policy position. Um, it's a lens that goes to the, the real passion these CEOs have for their businesses and their customers. Um, and it's, it's an invaluable picture that brought to life uh, the rather more formal and, dare I say, compliance-focused uh, disclosures. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Rosemary. So what I might do, and if we could just switch back to the uh, Charter Principles slide, thanks. Um, start with an observation and, and perhaps a somewhat provocative question to get us going, and it's to go back to a, a threshold question, which is that the Charter, and if we get the slide back, oh, sorry, I've got a different thing here. Uh, the, the Charter literally 
puts consumers at the center. So this is, a, this is actually part of the charter document. Yet the research we've seen today shows that despite being distru distrustful of and dissatisfied with the energy supply sector, all groups are still largely disengaged, disinterested and feel disempowered. One of the most uh, impactful graphics I saw today was of the, the two uh, needles, you know, with consumer interest far to the left, almost on empty, yet consumer frustration far to the right, almost fully, fully frustrated. So the question is, um, as a threshold question, should consumers really be at the centre of energy regulation the way the law requires, business strategy typically would suggest? I is that a valid assumption? If so, why? If so, why not? And John, I might start with you if that's okay. Sure. <coughs> um, the, simple, the simple answer to the question is yes, absolutely, unequivocally. Um, customers, customers have to be at the centre of everything the sector does because ultimately, this is a statement of the blindingly obvious, but ultimately customers pay, pay for the service. They are the, they are the end consumers and the only, the only source of revenue. And so they, they do have to be at the centre. Um, and, that's, and that's always been the case. It will be, it will be increasingly the case, the case going forward because of, in, to, once again to oversimplify, because of digitisation and the greater empowerment of customers. So customers will have, have far greater data and they will have far greater optionality in terms of how they, how they obtain, how they utilise and how they trade electrons or energy, energy per se. Um, and that, that is the, the sort of element of this energy revolution that is the least progressed and will be the most impactful. And so customers, customers fundamentally do have to be right at the core and every decision made across the industry has to be hearing, hearing the customer voice up front and keeping the customer front and centre at all times. Otherwise, there will be missteps and there will be, frankly, there will be, there'll be um, you know, wasted investment if, if, the, if the views and requirements of customers are not, not taken into account. Thank you. Um, definitely. Uh, yes, we should be. And it's not only just at the centre of the energy industry's world, but at the centre of the regulator's world and the centre of the, of the CARG Energy Council's world. Um, because uh, you know, building a coal-fired power station in Collinsville is not in the best interests of consumers, and using public money to do that is definitely not in the best interests of consumers. Um, and, and John's right, we, we pay the bill, and in, in the current environment, we take all the risk as well. And, and with such an environment of change, we, that can't continue. And I think, again, go back to one of my original comments around the conversations between the industry and its customers, um, I think a lot of the industry is starting to recognise that too. That you know, it's, it's un, There's a level of, of fairness in play here that with so many new market entrants coming in um, who are taking value out of the market through profit, and that's fine, they should do that, but they should also pay their fair share of the, of, of the cost of, of doing that and take their fair share of the risk. Um, so the old ways need to change, and this is one of the partnerships that I hope the Energy Charter can start to, to foster is that we talk about these issues amongst those affected parties and then start to coalesce around what the, what the ideas look like to improve it. Because it's, it's in our best interest and it's in their best interest to get a better outcome that keeps people in business, that ensures the lights stay on and all those sorts of things. And the, the, the charter itself focused a lot on vulnerable customers at the bottom end, and that's not derogatory, but at the, the smaller customer end. And that is absolutely right. But there's another group of vulnerable customers or at-risk customers which are very large commercial industrials who have absolutely no choice but to consume electricity and gas in the way they currently consume it. Now, the, they, and I can tell you now, um, from an energy efficiency point of view, when you're spending a million dollars a day on energy, you're being pretty efficient. Um, but they really, t and, and to change from that fundamentally is basically you bulldoze the facility and you start again, and, and that's so that's they're not going to do that. So they're kind of trapped in this, and they're the ones who, who also need a bit of help 
on their way through this journey as we transition the energy market. Otherwise, you know, this, this is significant job losses if we don't get this right. So again, coming back to the Charter, I hope that the Charter can, can foster those relationships and have, an, have a bit of an ideas incubator, if you like, and we can then go to governments and regulators to say, look, buyers and sellers are in agreement on this thing. We need to fix it. We need to fix it in this way that has the customer outcome at the centre. Ben, yeah, I was going to say, Ben, from a networks perspective, how, how does a networks business put customers, end customers, at the centre? Sure, and I think the, the, the question is really, customers are at the centre, but their engagement is low and they're frustrated. Is that a paradox? Is that um, contradictory? Does it make sense? And I think it, 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 you can see the way through that. Customers absolutely should be at the centre, but the definition of success is to make it easy so that the customers can be lowly engaged and get on with more interesting stuff than you know, paying for their utility bills, which is pretty boring, right? Then you need to find a way to do that. I think it's important to recognize where we get it right and where we don't get it right. And we're in the middle of doing our largest ever customer engagement exercise in the context of our South Australian review at the moment. And it's quite clear, firstly, the level of understanding, gas networks are even one step further removed, right? You know, you move into a house or an apartment, there's already a gas connection. It always works, you never think about it. If you thought about it, you know you can switch retailers so somebody else must own the pipes, but you never, you don't think about it, right? What do we do well? It's quite clear when we engage with customers, safety and reliability are the most important thing because everybody's aware that gas is a fuel, right? It burns, so safety and reliability are very, very important, but the trust is high. The customers, they, that's their most important thing, but they're not worried about that. They trust us. They know that we've got that under control. Therefore, what do they worry about? They worry about the bit which is high maintenance, which is if they do need to deal with us, how's the customer service, and what's the price and affordability like? So the model, I think, for networks, and, and I think this applies to, to all networks, traditionally we do do the safety and the reliability very well, actually, and just go to some other places in the world and, and that will remind you of that. What we need to do is make the price, the affordability, the customer service experience like the safety and the reliability experience. I think that's what it means to put customer at the centre, make it easy for them. Jared, what's your perception of the customer experience? Are they seeing a change as a result of the charter processes, which as John says, while it's been, if you like, visible above the surface for a year, it's really been going on for longer than that? Uh, I think it's early days. I think that it's difficult to say that the, you know, the general customer in the community could tell much difference today, but let's hope that you know, over time that will change. I mean, in terms of your initial question about the customer at the centre, I mean, absolutely, of course. Um, the, and we heard this morning from the research, we're reminded that even if, you know, with, with data with digitisation, yes, a proportion of people may be more empowered, but many people are still, they're busy, they're, they're, they're disengaged, they've got other things to get on with in their lives. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, a, a corporate strategy that has the customer at the centre, a regulatory system that looks for customer outcomes, um, are key to ensuring um, the trust that's necessarily that means that that disengaged customer is not ripped off. I think in the past we've had uh, a retail market structure that have profited from the disengaged group. We've had uh, a network arrangements where customers don't even understand that there are networks, so they're completely disengaged. Um, and so, yeah, uh, th this sort of um, the principle I think is it's extremely important to sort of re um, re engineer that. Can I, uh, thanks, Rob. Can I just make a comment on have we noticed a difference? And I, I agree with Jared that it's, it's too early to tell, really. But just to call out, with for, for, for the New South Wales and Victorian businesses in particular, with this you know biblical <laughs> weather season that we've had, bushfires, most money for the locusts to come as well. Um, this system has been smashed, and the industry has responded incredibly well to that. But not only responded incredibly well in getting people out on there and to, to repair things, but the way that the industry has communicated, both in the amount of communication, but more importantly, the quality of the communication. Well, I've actually noticed, and a few of my um, colleagues have noticed, a significant increase or improvement in that. So that's, it seems like a small thing, but for consumers just, they know if a bushfire goes through, the power's gonna go out. They know if the system's been washed out to sea, then it's gonna take time to fix it. But knowing how long and the, and the active recovery and being kept in the loop on that, that's part of the transparency equation. So people expect it. 
Like if you crash your car, you don't expect to get it back tomorrow. No, it's going to take time to repair. It's going to take time to repair the system. So just communicate about that. So we actually have seen an improvement. So if that's just a small part of a bigger, bigger improvement, then, then I look forward to it. Mark, coming to your observation about customer uh, moments and the call centre operator reading the legally correct script but completely meaningless, um, how do you drive that sort of cultural change? As Rosemary said, it's very clear that at the top level of organisations is a real buy-in and commitment to this. But how is it being driven through the organisation? I think it does come back to putting the customer at the heart of, of everything we do. Um, in, say, the context of the call centre example, um, we have a program which um, sounds quite basic, but ultimately we've been running a program for three years which starts with make sure we listen to what the customer has to say. Don't solve a problem they haven't told us about. Make sure we understand the problem that they've got because the only problem we can solve is the one that they have that they need to tell us about. And if we correctly diagnose the problem, then we know 70% of the time we can solve it then and there. Uh, if we don't listen to their problem, we can't do that. So in order to, uh, that sounds like something that's quite basic, but when you've got something like 2,000 people who talk to customers and you want to get the same experience to everyone, um, then you've got to design a machine that actually makes that happen. And so we have um, all sorts of things designed to do that. We have the scripts that are designed to ask very open questions to make sure that um, people um, ask those open questions and test with the customers. We have the team leaders who have a certain amount of their time every week to go through and just check um, what did they say on the calls, how did it work, coach the, coach the team. We have quality assurance people who go through and look at how we're asking questions, not just all the technical details, but just how are we doing it? Are we open enough uh, to make sure we get those answers? And then we follow that up by making sure that from the board down, everyone sees the results that come through and the satisfaction scores from the customers and the verbatims and listens to some calls to see that uh, it's all there. So it's, it's really about, yep, the intent is to have the customer there at the centre of everything we do, but the way the organisation works needs to be designed so that that's impossible to not achieve it. Andrew Bills, your comment about the, uh, the, the coal-powered the coal fire, coal-fired power generator technician reminded me of a, something I saw in a documentary once about an American aircraft carrier. And the document, documentary maker asked a young fighter pilot do you feel like a warrior? And the fighter pilot said, yes, absolutely, of course I did. And then they asked the same question of a, um, a sailor whose job was deep, deep, deep in the bowels of the ship, literally responsible for the garbage ejection machinery. And you can see this guy think about it for a moment, goes, yeah, yeah, I am, because without what I do, it can't work. How do you, in that sort of cultural piece, make sure that everybody understands that really what we're doing here is a customer service, customer-centric activity? Yeah, look, it, it, it's in multiple layers and levels to it. And I'll start with, you know, fundamentally keeping that power on, like over the summer period, making sure that it's there 24-7 has a massive impact on what customers end up paying for the cost of energy, right? So making them understand that connection. So to me, it's around transparency. So look, here's what the demand was. Here's where prices are going. Here's what our impact was on that. So you can relate it to the individual level. So that preventative maintenance or that particular initiative that they put in place to make a change has a direct outcome on price. So that's that's part of what you, you, you've got to bring that to life more and more and more. And my realization was that, that that transparency to what was happening just wasn't wasn't occurring, right? So maybe in 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 the metropolitan you know office, but not out in the region. So getting that access through. I think the next part of it is actually. You, having the dialogue, actually having the discussion, which is, and, and this is where it's a, double, a little bit of a double-edged sword. So when you talk to someone who works in a coal-fired power station for many decades, renewables are seen as a threat and uh, they're quite defensive about it, a lot of them. And I, I kind of get that because they've got lives which have been based in these regions for many years and they've got families and they've got... You know, and th these are these are remote areas, and they're like going, well, what happens when this place goes? What do I do? And this goes to the whole heart of just transition and what happens to these these communities. Um, so you've got to start that discussion around. Well, how actually, by us getting closer to the customer, actually helps you with that transition, and actually helps you with the opportunities that will occur. So if we 
can get hydrogen up and running at the site, if we can get a battery up and running at the site, if we can do more PPAs on renewable projects, that all halts the underlying value of the coal asset that we have. So you've got to have that dialogue and you've got to, you've got to keep repeating it, repeating it and repeating it because you're talking changing people's attitudes which have been there for decades. So that's part of it. And, I think, and the next part, the, the other thing I'll just add is one of the things that we've done is we do have a large CNI customer base as well. And getting those customers, this sounds really simple, um, and I know a lot of you in the room are like, oh, oh. Um, just getting them to come into executive strategy sessions, getting them to come into the board, getting them to come in and say, well, how's the experience with CS Energy? What's it been like? Um, what would you change? What would you do differently? What's troubling you? What are your issues? That is just worth so much for achieving that cultural change, but just opening that door and making that happen. So, yeah, there's not one thing, multiple, multiple layers to it. Rosemary, um, perhaps as a participant in the process, but also to a degree an observer of the process, what has been the least expected thing that you've observed, that, the thing that surprised you the most about what's happened so far? Um, well, I, I, what I'd like to do is um, perhaps um, reflect on three things that were just said um, because um, not that they're unexpected, but I think people are starting to really reflect customer at the centre in ways that um, don't stand out, that are just becoming part of the conversation. Um, and that, to me, is it's not surprising in the sense that, you know, so many um, things were lined up to get that outcome. Um, but it's, um, it's remarkable because I think we're starting to see new language. So the three examples that we've just had just now are um, where people are starting to uh, design their businesses and change their cultures so that customer outcomes are in, at the centre of the focus. So, for example, the call centre. Um, the objective is no longer, uh, possibly it never was, to handle the calls within the KPI of 10 seconds for the call centre. The objective now is to solve the problem and the strategy is a design approach which says first listen to the customer. So this is customer at the centre in action as far as I can see. Um, Andrew's example of um, you know, speaking with your folks about the price outcome of what we're doing, that to me is customer at the centre you know, in, a, in an unexpected place, one would have to say. And perhaps a few years ago that might not have been the approach um, and then the um, network examples over summer, uh, just to add to the point, the, the language that is being used is no longer, um, and uh, I, would, I would always like, uh, you know, people's crews to be called out for the wonderful work they're doing and we're restoring our network. And if you go back even 12 months ago and look at the language on the Twitter feed of networks, it was about our network and our crews and so on. Now the language is, thanks for your patience, sorry for the inconvenience, you know, we're really sorry this happened. There's language that is actually very inclusive of the consumer experience um, in those communications. Uh, so I think, you know, across the value chain, we're now seeing really practical examples of customer at the centre of people's thinking. Um, the hard work of designing processes that deliver um, all the time uh, is a topic that we'll get onto um, in the next session of, uh, of this day. Um, I just wanted to go back also, Rob, to your um, opening uh, comment for this series of uh, discussion points, and that is consumers low on interest, um, high on uh, dissatisfaction. Um, the research that we've brought to everybody today is really, it's really dense and extremely rich. We, we have danced over the top of it um, today, I'd have to tell you, and um, uh, links to the, the full research reports, both for households and businesses, will be sent to all of you and it'll be up on our website. Um, there is much information in that research which I think starts to explain uh, why we're seeing this dichotomy of um, 
people uh, wanting to be at the centre of everything but being disengaged. I think the answer is that at the moment we haven't quite cracked the equation where people are feeling satisfied with what's uh, coming from the energy sector, uh, seeing value and therefore being engaged. I think people are seeing complexity and difficulty and you know, poor outcomes at the moment. And the, the usual human reaction in that circumstance is to step back rather than lean in. I suspect over time, through vehicles such as the Energy Charter and a range of other efforts that I know are going on inside these businesses, that we'll start to see consumers becoming more satisfied, seeing more value and feeling more positively just, uh, inclined to become engaged. These things feed off each other. The disengagement that we're seeing, I think, is a perfectly understandable reaction by consumers to pain coming at them at the moment from the energy sector. Thanks. Just um, <clears throat> one more comment on customer at the centre. I'll start with a story. Um, one of our member companies was sitting in uh, an engagement session with, with a major energy company and said, I spend $80 million a year in this state on energy and if I've got a problem, I have to dial 131 and get the call centre. Um, I spend half a million dollars a year on telecommunications and I've got an account manager and their mobile phone number. And it just was, it was just so stark, the difference in, in approach. And when I was a 30-year-old boy, I was an account manager in the, in the early stages of the electricity sector. And you had your set of accounts and, you know, you went out and visited them. And at the end of the day, it was a pretty stable environment and you were just a delivery boy for a, for a, for a price. Things have changed so dramatically now that... The need for, and I'm really pleased to start to, to see account management start to come back, so that more personal management for high value customers, because they really do need that nurturing now. It's not just about price. It's about how do I, how do I understand, or do I, I need to understand what makes up the bill. I mean, I was, I was talking to, to Andrew before about um, when we go and talk to new, new potential members for, for our organisation, they say, I've just negotiated a new retail contract. Why do I need to be part of you? So, well, you've negotiated 15% of the value. 85% of the value of your bill comes from networks which you can't negotiate. You can't negotiate away a bad policy that drives up wholesale prices. Or So getting them to understand those elements is really important. Being their partner in technology is really important because some of them are looking behind the meter and they're looking for that help. So I think it's great to see that account management come back and hopefully if you're spending $80 million a year, you actually get a mobile phone number of an account manager that you can call. I want to come back to uh, two of the themes that were developed in the Independent uh, Accountability Panel's report around the development of metrics and then reporting on progress and closing the loop on initiatives, and particularly perhaps in the frame of vulnerable uh, customers. And I guess in this context, to pick up Andrew's point, many business customers are vulnerable, but I will speak more so about residential and residential customers. And Jared, what is it that you think that particularly CEOs and perhaps through the CEO Council could be doing to sort of develop those metrics, report on progress, but really closing the loop on those initiatives? Um, so I think that customer vulnerability uh, needs to be thought about in a, in a really different and broad sense. I think in the past, we often really jumped to consideration of people who are in have payment difficulties or have got debts um, and I would say that that's one aspect of customer vulnerability and in fact um, people, uh, and nearly anybody can be vulnerable at any point in their life. If something calamitous happens to you, um, you know, even the example of someone whose uh, partner passes away, so they're in bereavement and they're having to change addresses and bills and contacts um, uh, they may actually have some resources in terms of money to pay the bill, but that interaction is at a time of severe vulnerability. So I think that there's some work to be done inside um, businesses to have a, a deep engagement with what vulnerability means, um, and then to be thinking about, well, what, how do we respond to that? I mean, one of the ways we encourage businesses to respond is to be taking a sort of a universal design approach, recognising that customers can be uh, vulnerable at any time, 
um, and therefore design your interactions with customers and your, your from, from sending out a bill to your call centres that, you know, the next person could be that vulnerable customer. And so it's sort of a, a becoming a business as usual. Um, turning those into metrics, I agree, is a, a, is a challenging proposition and there may be some um, ways that it is done that does initially focus on areas such as you know, uh, are we actually disconnecting more people? Are we um, ca causing debt? But I would encourage people to go further than that. I, I th just one point about um, one thing that I've seen changed since the Charter um, in terms of customer vulnerability. Um, my organisation, together with a couple of other consumer organisations last year, looked at uh, and released a report about um, the debt sale industry. Um, uh, and we looked at one particular, it was one particular debt purchaser who was buying a lot of uh, bank, utility, telco debt and unlike others in that sector was using pretty harsh collection measures including court-based collections and in particular they were identifying customers who had homes and using bankruptcy. So, you know, for, which actually results in a very small debt becoming large very quickly and the loss of a home. And I, uh, we uh, released some information about that. We released a report to kind of uh, show the issues. And I was very impressed that the energy businesses actually responded with reference to the energy charter. Um, they talked about the charter as, oh, you know, we, we've really got to think about doing this differently because that's an example of, of, of customer vulnerability that we haven't done very well. So I think, you know, those instances where they identify things in their businesses and change them is an important uh, thing to be reporting back on to close those loops. John, not, not so much a question on what would the metrics be or particular actions to close loops, but more so the process of working through the, the group of CEOs. How do you start to develop those and, and drive them through businesses? It's a, <clears throat> it's a great question and it will be, it will be one of the, the biggest single challenges over the next 12 months and through the next, the next um, disclosure process and, and IAP report process. Because as, as, had, as has been said, we, we ended up with some inconsistent metrics um, and there is, there will be huge value in terms of, in terms of getting the right outcomes in having, in having a very succinct list of metrics. Now, clearly, we can't have exactly the same metrics for re at the retail end of the, the spectrum as the generation or or transmission or distribution. So we need to think very carefully about that. But that is that is something that um, certainly the the CEO council will be working on in the near future. Um, and it will require a level of collaboration between the Independent Accountability Panel and the CEO Council and the, and the Energy Charter to, to ensure we do get the right, the right metrics. And we also need to acknowledge that it might, it might take a year or two or three for them to evolve to exactly the right point. And then they, and they should evolve as we go forward because the industry will continue to change as well. I think we're about to start some uh, audience questions, but perhaps just while we're waiting for them to come up, Mark, do you have a, a view whether it's a, an NPS-style approach or what sort of things those metrics could look like? We certainly use Net Promoter Score as a way to measure um, a customer experience, and the the basic idea is you're measuring how many customers would promote you as opposed to to recommend you go with someone else. Um, whatever metrics are used in the energy charter, um, we, we do have a view that they will be best if they are used in the core of how we run the business. So something like Net Promoter Score for us is going to be something that we would recommend. Um, and we'd also recommend that the reporting we do to regulators, because we do a lot of reporting to regulators, whether it's uh, at the retail level or the distribution companies. But if we all ran towards the same sort of metrics that are how we run the the business, then we've got the most chance of getting sustainable outcomes. 